So, last time we left off our Hillbrook history lesson, Dr. Peter Lawrence had resigned as director and handed over the reins to Dr. Joshua Stone. This was in 1949. So, let's now continue on with our tour of the past. Dr. Joshua Stone joined the Hillbrook staff in the early 1940s and quickly became a prodigy of Lawrence. The two shared the same ideals and treatment methods. In other words, Stone was just as cruel as Lawrence was, and even if he hadn't been, he surely would have become so under the guidance of Lawrence. After Lawrence resigned, Stone made sure to cover up all the crimes his former boss and mentor had committed, all the patients who had died in his reckless care. Stone then continued to run the asylum in a similar manner to Lawrence, however less sadistic and more stern. Hillbrook under Stone's care was less about treating the mentally ill and more about punishing the wicked. The asylum, which had originally been a hospital under Dr. Markway's care, then a butcher shop under Lawrence's care, now began to resemble more a harsh prison. Common prison methods for punishing inmates were introduced, and Stone was less a doctor and more a firm warden. Most people would say he was unfit to run a hospital for the mentally ill, but the conditions of Hillbrook Asylum weren't known to the public. In fact, not much at all was known about Hillbrook at the time. The administration kept a closed lid on their activities, the government left them alone, the patients had no rights whatsoever, and the public didn't deem it fitting to pry. All of this combined made it possible for the Hillbrook staff to practically do whatever they wanted. Stone's firm rule went on undisturbed throughout the 1950s, 60s and beginning of the 70s. Many patients came and went during this time, but we're only going to focus on one of them, namely patient 403, Alec LaSalle. LaSalle was the leader of a bizarre cult known as the Artisans. LaSalle himself was known as the Mad Artist, or Papa Sunshine to his cult members. In 1968, the Artisans began a crime tour across America, committing seemingly random and pointless crimes. Pointless because despite hitting liquor stores and the like, they never actually stole anything, not money anyway. In fact, a common theme was the cultists burning all the money in the stores. Property damage as well as murder seemed to be their objective. As it would eventually be discovered, the reason for these crimes was art. LaSalle and his followers considered murder and destruction to be a form of art and viewed themselves as performance artists. Their biggest performance took place in 1972, when they hit a major Wall Street bank. As usual, no money was stolen, ironically. Two years later, LaSalle, alongside a few of his subjects, were finally caught by the police. LaSalle was deemed insane and sent to Hillbrook. The mad artist would prove to be the most dangerous patient the asylum has ever seen and his presence led to the darkest days in our entire history. It was September 9th of 1974. LaSalle had only been in Hillbrook for a week, when almost 100 members of his cult stormed the asylum. The cult had earlier raided an army base and were thus in the possession of multiple rocket launchers and assault rifles. The Hillbrook security staff didn't stand a chance. The cultists quickly made their way inside the premises, and there they found and freed their leader. LaSalle and his minions then proceeded to free all the remaining patients, every single one of them let out of their cells. Together, patients and cultists alike started a massive riot and soon seized control of the entire asylum. They hunted down and killed as many staff members as possible. The police were helpless to stop any of this, and the National Guard was called in. What then followed was an intense battle, an outright war that lasted for five days. In the end, the rioters were finally defeated, and control of Hillbrook was regained. 104 patients, 59 staff members, and 35 National Guardsmen and law enforcement officers were dead. 
Director Joshua Stone and Alec LaSalle himself were among the casualties. The buildings themselves had also sustained massive damage. According to some surviving cult members, the goal was never to help LaSalle escape. The goal was the riot itself, cause as much carnage as possible, all in the name of art, of course. The destruction of Hillbrook was LaSalle's masterpiece. What then followed was a long recuperation process. Dr. Nikolai Resnikov, one of few surviving doctors, was put in charge and led the reconstruction of the asylum. While it was being rebuilt, all patients were temporarily housed at Blackburn Penitentiary. Resnikov had not worked at Hillbrook for very long at all. In fact, he joined the staff in 1971, only three years earlier. Resnikov was a defector of the Soviet Union and fled to the United States to find freedom. Very little is known of his life in the Soviet Union, but it is highly speculated he was involved in government experiments with mind control. While at the same time as he was rebuilding the asylum, Resnikov was also tasked with clearing Hillbrook's name. With the massive media attention surrounding the riot, people also began to discover the asylum's past and long-buried secrets. The crimes of both Lawrence and Stone were brought to light for the first time, and the public finally learned what Hillbrook truly was. To combat the truth though, once the asylum stood rebuilt, Resnikov began to invite news teams to tour the place and interview patients. These news crews weren't allowed to see all of the asylum though, only select parts, specifically prepared for visits, and the patients picked for interviews were always the compliant ones, non-violent offenders with sense enough to follow Resnikov's instructions. In other words, it was all staged. Because despite Hillbrook's new squeaky clean image, behind the curtains it was all business as usual. Resnikov was not at all what he seemed, and not even the staff truly knew the real him. Of course, keep in mind that these are just speculations, but it is heavily suspected that Resnikov was in fact just a puppet of the CIA, and he had been all along. The CIA had planted him at Hillbrook specifically with the goal of taking over, and luckily for them, the perfect opportunity came with the riot. After coming to America, the CIA contacted Resnikov and basically threatened to send him back to the Soviets. Unless he began to work for them, continue his experiments for them. And what better guinea pigs to use than the criminally insane? His position at Hillbrook was thus arranged, and credentials were faked. So while Resnikov played tour guide for reporters during the daytime, showcasing the new and improved Hillbrook, at nighttime he was holed up in a basement, subjecting hapless patients to mind control experiments. CIA agents posing as staff members are said to have assisted him in these endeavors. Again though, no concrete proof exists of any of this. But then again, for the longest time, it neither did for Dr. Lawrence's activities. Maybe someday the truth will come out and be officially acknowledged. In 1980, Resnikov also began additional expansion of the asylum, adding room for our current 1000 cells, doubling the patient capacity. Patients with bizarre abilities also began to increase during the Resnikov administration, the very types of patients we now have banned. Unnatural patients had been around since Dr. Markway's days, but they used to be a minority. Resnikov, however, seemed insistent that these people were admitted to Hillbrook. Some say he even made a deal with the government to have them delivered to us upon discovery. It is heavily speculated that this was yet another part of his CIA work, and neither treating nor imprisoning these people was the real goal. Who knows though? Dr. Nikolai Resnikov's reign lasted all the way to 1998, when he stepped down as director. He was replaced by Dr. Karen Stein. 
Dr. Stein joined the Hilberg staff in 1989. She never got along with her boss, Resnikov. Stein was an idealist and a great admirer of Markway Hilbrook. She came to Hilbrook to try and reform the place, bring it back to its original vision. Stein was also the first staff member to officially accuse Resnikov of performing experiments on the patients and lobbied hard to have him removed from power. Her efforts didn't work, however, and she had to wait for Resnikov to step down on his own accord. With him went also the supposed CIA connection, and all supposed experiments ceased. Stein seized the opportunity to step up in his place, and she could then finally begin to realize her and Markway's dreams. And so she did. Stein brought back healing and caring to Hillbrook. Almost a century later, Hillbrook Asylum was once again a hospital. A place where the criminally insane were treated and not tortured. Nothing lasts forever though, as we've learned so well. Stein's optimism didn't hold up so well once in the director's chair. Running this place can take its toll on you, I ought to know. The good doctor began to grow jaded, tired and disillusioned. The rough, incurable patients made their mark on her, and she began to consider Markway a naive fool. You can't treat these people, they're monsters. Such was the new attitude she was beginning to form. What truly broke her was the arrival of patient 602, Jeremiah Sykes, aka Hollow. Hollow was a serial killer of children. He believed that children were all possessed by Satan, and that the only way to cure them was to empty them of all of their insides, making them hollow. He used to describe this process in detail to Stein, and express glee while doing so. Serving God and fighting Satan was something he greatly enjoyed after all. Somewhere during her sessions with Hollow, Stein snapped. She pulled a Lawrence and killed him with an overdose of electric shock therapy. Of course, it was once again officially ruled as an accident, but we all know the truth. Once again, Hillbrook was back to its old self. Stein may have originally wanted to be Markway Hillbrook, but she ended up being Peter Lawrence instead. Some say it's this place that does it to you, that this place is cursed. Who knows? Anyway, in 2009, she hired me, completely ignoring my little incident back in Sweden. We got along just fine, and I was very saddened when Stein fell off a bridge and drowned five years ago. The police never could figure out if it was suicide, an accident, or if she was pushed. Some silly people say I did it, but really, come on, that is just ridiculous. Besides, I have an alibi. And if anyone ever brings this subject up again, they're fired. On the 100th anniversary of Hilbrook Asylum, I took over. And here we are. Who knows what the future will bring Hilbrook? Now with our ban on those super-powered patients, I feel we can finally go back to doing what we're supposed to do. Curing the criminally insane. And I promise, I'm not going to go cuckoo like Lawrence and Stein and start shocking people to death. Nor am I going to perform experiments for the CIA. No, I believe the glory days are ahead of us. And may Hillbrook last for another hundred years. Thus concludes the history lesson of Hillbrook Asylum. You may all return to your duties.